Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah again. Um, <coughs> first I'd like to thank uh, the MSA here. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. I'm very honored uh, to be here, Alhamdulillah. And mashallah, it's, it's very beautiful to see at the end of like a school year when you have dinners like this and you get to step back and say what you're thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And it's very beautiful that out of the MSA activities that some of the main things that you're proud of is not necessarily um, a lecture that you uh, organize or something like that, but it's what you gave back to the community. And indeed, that's how things are measured. It's what benefit did you bring back to the community. <clears throat> My topic for tonight, inshallah ta'ala, is uh, called Time the Precious Gift. And interestingly, before, um, on my way here, I, um, is there like a soccer game going on? <laughs> What's that? Kendo. Kendo? Martial arts? <clears throat> I was actually reading a story on the way here, and, and even though I was busy this morning, I took the time to print out this story, and on the entire ride here, I was reading and contemplating this story. And I think it's most important, especially with uh, some of you graduating and, and others uh, moving towards, for example, like making money, right? Not necessarily education, but making money. I think, inshallah ta'ala, this would be very beneficial for you. <clears throat> it all starts. The story starts with me at a, at a convention. Anybody from Malaysia here? Malaysia, Indonesia? Yeah. <laughs> I was at a, you ever heard of MISG, I think it's that? The, the Malaysian Students Association or something like that in the U.S.? No? Okay, look them up, inshallah. <clears throat> I was at their conference, and it was in the December, um, December break, I think 2002 or something like that. And at the conference, I was in, uh, just early in the morning, I went down to the, to, to the gym and there was like a TV there. Because they don't watch TV, but there's a TV there in the gym room. And it was Good Morning America. <coughs> Want me to speak louder? It was Good Morning America. And on TV, there was a guy with a big black cowboy hat that won $300 million. Do you guys remember that guy? John Whittaker or something like that? you guys remember? No? He, he won $300 million. It was the biggest... It was the biggest uh, lottery win ever, like one single person winning, 300 million. And he took it in a lump sum, I think he took 150, like the government took like half of that or something like that. <laughs> he took 150, uh, 15 million, and he came on TV. And it's interesting because I was watching him, and I was actually, I used him as an example in a lecture I think I gave later on in that day. Because he said on TV that he was going to give 10% of his money to the local church. And then I thought that in Islam, uh, gambling is haram. And even if you have a good intention, it's still forbidden in Islam. And that kind of money isn't something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with, even if you give. What's interesting is that this morning, I actually read his whole story three years later and what happened to him with the money. Because usually what people um, go for in life, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <coughs> وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ That he is intense in his love for and the khayr here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying as it says in the tafsir that their love for money. And a lot of people, and actually I was speaking to a person just very recently who said his mother was very intense on him finishing his studies and doing good in, in studies. And then I said, is that really the issue or is the issue that she needs you to be financially strong? And then when he thought about it, it's just about the money. And so I was also thinking that uh, how many people are like planning to go to med school or in med school or something like that? Not too many people. We're in Canada here, right? <coughs> what is it, IT or engineering that you guys are doing here? Engineering? Engineering people? IT? IT? Arts? <laughs> okay. <coughs> I was, I was asking this question because usually when you go to a lot of places, people typically say that it's, um, that they're studying medicine and their parents are forcing them and they've told them things like, you're not going to get married unless you're a doctor with money, right? Have you guys heard that before? You're not going to get married unless you're a doctor with money and they're like, become doctor first and then you get married and stuff like that. 
And so I'd always tell the person, I said, are you studying this? Like they said, I'm studying medicine. I would always ask them, are you studying this because your community forced you because of the money factor? Or do you really love to study medicine? Like you really care for people? Because if they care for people and they want to help people, then I'll tell them, then you're in the right field. But if you're in it for the money, then you're going to hate what you're doing, no matter what you do. Whether you're doing IT, or whether you're doing arts, or whether you, if money is your goal, then you're going to hate your job. And you're actually going to be living in pain, and you're going to start saying it's not worth it, and you might take other means. Anyhow, this person, uh, John Whitaker, he was in his 60s, and he got $300 million one shot. Came on TV, said he was going to give it to a church, and, and so on and so forth. The lady, and I just want to like just explain basically what happened. It's a little longer, but there's an end to it that inshallah ta'ala, I hope that you can extract your own lessons from it. The lady that sold him the ticket, she knew him very well. It's a small town in uh, West Virginia, and she used to make $5 an hour. So when he won the lottery ticket, he said on TV that he's going to give a special gift to the lady that he bought the ticket from. And she was all excited. He came and like, boom, he gave her like $50,000. He bought her a house, bought her a car, and she instantly became, well, people thought she won a million dollars herself, but she didn't, but she became a celebrity. So she went from $5 an hour to her family thinking that she had won a million. And then right there, she lost her family in the sense that they thought she was arrogant. They stopped visiting her. Nobody started talking. Everybody was either asking her for money or they thought she was arrogant. So she immediately lost her friends. He went on TV saying that he was going to donate his money, but in reality what he did is he said, well, I only have 10 years to live. This is my paradise, basically, so I need to live it to the maximum. And so his wife, who he'd been with for many years when he was broke and all of that, he stopped going home. And he would spend his evenings at, um, at the bar. And in fact, it was a strip bar. Women uh, dressing, undressing themselves and so on and so forth. And he came into the bar that night after being on TV saying he was going to give the money to the church. Or you can just, instead of church, put in the local masjid. Right? As people say, I'm going to give my money to the local masjid. And he slapped down $50,000 on the table. And he said, I can have whatever I want. And they were scared. You don't walk around with $50,000 cash. Right? He's like, people can get killed for like five dollars. And you're walking around with fifty. And he was completely drunk. Every night he'd come in completely drunk. And then he, he turned to zina. He turned to adultery. And, and the strip bars. And he actually, this, this man used to go around. This is in the Washington Post. He used to go around and, and in front of uh, women's husband, he would offer them, he said, how much would it t take for me to sleep with you? in front of their husbands. He said, I'll give you $10,000, I'll give you whatever. Anybody can be bought by money. And so they said, in the beginning, he, everybody was like, hooray, the good doer, let's you know, uh, make him the mayor because he has money. And then after a while, his clothes started to get all haggity, uh, raggedy and all of that stuff. He stopped combing his hair and basically would treat everybody like dirt. And he made a statement to the effect of, you know, he started going around saying, you don't know who I am, I'm John Whitaker, I have more money than God. And you do what I say. And the money, basically, like the, like some people say, it was like the Lord of the Rings. You know that little guy where he goes, my precious, right, that guy? I know you guys know that one, right? That it basically consumes him, and then he became the money. So what happened after that is that he had a daughter. Sorry, and... Um, uh, his granddaughter, 16 years old, he's just like, boom, this is a small town, they don't have money. Overnight, just, she comes in with a Hummer, she comes in with, you know, these $70,000, $80,000 cars, multiple cars, not just one, many of them, and a high school where kids don't even have cars. And she becomes immediately hated by the whole school. And for her protection, she actually had to be homeschooled. She was taken out of the school. The people who saw her said, we've never seen a more bitter, more angrier 16-year-old girl in our life. And so she started buying friends. And, and actually her grandfather, John Whitaker, used to go around paying people. Do you want me to just hold the microphone? He used to go around uh, paying people to drive her around. So she'd go in the morning, pick up a $5,000 cash from her, from her grandfather, and then go around spending it. And, so, and, and as people would say, her car was basically a junk pile of 
pop bottles, CDs, electronics that are ripped up, and so on and so forth, and cocaine and drugs, and, and she basically went into drugs, and she's 16 years old. So people were divided amongst her. Anyhow, as it continued, she had, I think, two boyfriends. One of them like left, uh, left her, and the other one said, no, I'm in it for the money, and he went everywhere with her. He came, comes home one day to his father crying, and he's like on drugs, and he says, the little girl's name is Brandy. She's 16 years old. He says, she dumped me, and he's crying. And the father's like, you don't need her. We'll get you a good job, and so on and so forth. But he has to go from all that money to like $5 an hour. A few months later, he disappears, and they find him dead at Brandy's house on a drug overdose. This is a real story. These are real people. And if some of you already raised your hands, you know who these people are. He uh, was killed on drug overdose, and the police investigated because there was some robbing on that same night. They spent all their money to find out who robbed the house. And he's like, my son died. And they're like, the investigation's closed. Because I don't know anybody that murders with a drug overdose. You know, like there's no murder involved. But they wouldn't inve investigate who gave him the money to buy that much um, cocaine. And what's interesting even after that is that, um, and there's other parts of the story, the different people's lives that were ruined, the whole, the whole community and what happened to them. And he initially had started a foundation to donate, but everybody would come up to him and shout at him saying, give me money, I'm poor, I'm poor, until he closed down his foundation. He stopped giving the charity out to people and closed his house down and had security and all of that stuff. <coughs> the church which was just like a small uh, bench church where he said, I'm going to give my money to the church. He built this huge church, and it was fancy. It had all the gadgets, but it was called, I think, the Powerball Church, like the, lot the lottery church. And no one wanted to go there. And it became abandoned because they said, this is like the symbol of the evil that's happened to our city. And so the priest in, the, in that church is just giving his sermons, and no one's coming to it. <coughs> A couple of um, people were arrested trying to rob him and so on. You can go and read the story. In the end, um, his daughter Brandy, went, she just went missing, and then they found her body dead as well, um, wrapped up in, in, a, in like a body bag, drug overdose, and she was also killed. And so two of these, uh, uh, his own granddaughter was killed, and then his wife, when they actually interviewed her later, she said that, I wish the day that... <coughs> I wish the day that he had won the lottery that I had immediately ripped up that ticket and that this never happened because of all the pain and all the destruction that it went through. And the reason that I'm sharing this with you <coughs> is that a lot of us, when, when we ask the question, you know, what's time and where are we spending our time? Because as the topic for the, for the lecture is time, the precious gift. The problem is that a lot of people will spend their time, but it's in the path of making money. And so what I wanted to show you is show you the ultimate end. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that if that's your goal, then this is where it's going to end at. This is where it's going to end. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran gives us the story of Qarun. إِنَّ قَارُونَ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمِ مُوسَى فَبَغَى عَلَيْهِمْ It's interesting, Qarun is a story in the Qur'an about a man who used to make dua, used to pray at the time of, of Moses alayhi salam, he used to pray for money and Allah blessed him as a lesson for everybody else. Blessed him with the money, but then he took the money and forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Forgot everything else he said, it was my education, all my knowledge, all my business. He had so much money that these people even the keys to the, the treasure chest, they had to get like um, these huge bodybuilder type guys to carry the keys. That's not even the treasures, it's the keys to the treasures that are so heavy that the, the people can't carry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions in the Quran that when he said this, the regular people, just like you know, you go uh, down these famous, uh, I think each city has their special part of the town where the rich and famous live, right? Rodeo Drive or something like that. And when people drive down that, they're in the wrong area. If you don't get a ticket just for being in the area because your, the car is too shabby or something like that, you'll be looking around left and right and you might be saying to yourself, I wish I had what they had. I wish I had what they had. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about these people. When they saw Qarun, they said, they said to him, يَا لَيْتَ لَنَا مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيَ قَارُونَ إِنَّهُ لَذُ حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ 
they would say that we wish Allah would give us what He gave Qarun, that it's such a great like um, thing that He's been given. But those who were given knowledge, and this is the key because I'm actually inshallah ta'ala trying to save you of many years of hardship. And hopefully inshallah ta'ala there might be someone here beginning their journey in life in, in you know working and making money and so on and so forth that will start to see that there's a higher priority more than the making of the money and something that will make the money sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the people said in reply وَيْلَكُمْ ثَوَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لِمَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا that the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better for those who believe and do righteous actions and so just like you see people just like you've been spending these nights for example, studying for exams. I know there's one brother here who has an exam tomorrow, right? There's, these, there's still exams. Not all of you are actually finished your exams. But you'll spend the night awake. And if you ever tell yourself, and this is a, a reminder for me, a reminder for you. If you ever tell yourself, I can't get up for Fajr, realize that you're staying awake in order to get a degree, in order to get a job, in order to get money. You can do it. But it comes from the inside. And that's, what, that's where the priority has to be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. You can do it. Getting up for Fajr, getting all your prayers in line, and then success comes from there. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sorry, in the, in the Adhan we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Hayya al salah, come to success. So if, um, if everybody can stand up for a second, stand up. This is a little exercise, right? Because I know it's like lecture after lecture after lecture, right? A little exercise for you. What I want you to do is uh, close your eyes. Close your eyes. And imagine yourself at 70 years old. Imagine yourself at 70 years old. You took this education. You lived your life. You're now 70 years old. Whatever you look like. I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> you know. You're 70 years old, and now I want you to look at what your ibadah looks like at that age. Your ibadah, your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are you doing at that age? What do you see? Are you sitting at a home playing with kids, or are you actually doing some ibadah? Alright, have a seat. Open your eyes, have a seat. Does someone want to share with us what you saw? This is always the interesting part for me. Because I have no idea what you said, like I saw, like I said. Someone want to share? What did you see? You want to share? You saw yourself what? Giving lectures? Like me? <laughs> okay. So she was at a, how many people were in your lecture that you saw? You don't remember seeing anybody? <laughs> You're like in front of the mirror practicing your lectures. Okay, that's good. Talking. That's a good one. I actually did this like little assignment. I told people, close your eyes and imagine da'wah. And what do you see? And someone said, I see a long empty road. I'm like, that's good da'wah. Nobody in your road, right? You're not giving da'wah to anybody. You're doing nothing. That's like what da'wah is. Anyhow, someone else want to share? What did you see? I need one more person. Come on, you're in university, you like to talk. Yes? I was uh, standing uh, in, uh, in the open with a sunny day, and I was thinking about where the desert was. You were stand were you alone? Yes. Was it desert or was it like a snowy... It was green. It was green? So it must not have been Canada, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was snow. Uh, there's, there's green stuff in Canada, I admit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the reason... You, someone else? Yeah? You wasn't alive. You weren't alive. You had died many years before then. That's good. Because some of you already think you're going to be alive at that time. Which might be a delusion right there. That you think you're going to be alive at that time. It's interesting that a lot of, a lot of us, right, I haven't done this experiment too much and that's why I actually wanted to gather your feedback. But my, my theory and my, just my assumption is you might not have seen yourself doing amazing ibadah. Most likely. It might have been like you were at the masjid once a day or, you know, doing a lecture here and there. And this is like the end of your life after all these years. And what's um, scary or happy, depending on what you saw, is that what you just saw, that image, you're unconsciously moving towards that. 
you're unconsciously moving towards them. So if you didn't see yourself doing great ibadah, you're actually in the car driving towards that image. Mm -hmm. If you saw yourself old and brittle and sitting in a chair, you're moving towards that image. And you've unconsciously decided that's where you want to go. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where are you going? And now, you have to realize that with all of this time, the first priority has to be fixing your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fixing your connection with Allah azza wa jal. And that starts with the fard. It starts with the shahada, and the salah, and the zakah, and the salm, and the hajj. All of those things, and then the things underneath that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that there's going to be two times in our life, two times in our life where we're going to regret, when we're going to regret the time that we've wasted. And, I, and it's interesting that a lot of people when they come to the end of their university years, it's a time to reflect on how they spent these years. And, and actually look back and say, you know, I wish I had gone to more halakas or I wish I had gone to less halakas or something like that. And, or I wish I had done more of this or I wish I had spent more time with that person. But there's two times that a person will always remember these things. Number one is the time when they're about to die on earth. So if they're in a hospital bed or maybe like um, a boat's about to sink or something like that, it's a time where a person regrets. And you actually see in a lot of... Um, uh, in the pop culture, there will you know, be all these songs and uh, entertainment things, but usually one of these entertainers will have a death happen to them and their family. And then they'll make a song or something like that or a poem about, I wish I had the chance to say goodbye. You know, I wish you know, I had done this, I wish I had done that. And the second time that the person will regret is on the day of resurrection when they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where they regret how they had spent their time. And the most saddest thing, if you've ever said to yourself, I wish I had done something different, that's one of the most painful things you can say in your life. Where you get 20, 30 years later, and say, I wish I had spent my youth doing something else. That's a very sad moment to be in. Because that means you've lost that, that time, and it's not coming back. <coughs> In, um, in a lot of these lectures, and I'm sure in your years here in the university, you've seen people at the end of the uh, speeches saying, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa al-asr, inna al-insan la fi khusr, illa al-ladina amanu wa amilu al-salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqq, wa tawasaw bil-haqq, wa tawasaw bil-sabr." So you've heard this ayah. And the reminder has been set again and again and again. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies by time. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies by time. And interestingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies by the sun and testifies by the moon and testifies by the alteration of the days and nights. And you'll see all throughout all the surahs that you recite in Salah, wal duha wal layl or wal fajri wal ayal and ashr and you know wal shamsi wal duha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testifying again and again by these hours and minutes and days that make up your life. Because when it comes down to it, all you are is just hours and minutes. So in this, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies wal asr and Allah swears that humanity is at loss and actually another way of saying it is like humanity are losers by default you're a loser by default and if you don't if you um, doubt what I'm saying there just imagine that how much do you guys pay for your education here? like what? 25,000 or something like that? yeah? okay say about 25,000 if you pay 25,000 at the door, and you never came to class, and you never took any exams, would you get your degree in the end? If you're in arts, maybe. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. I know arts people get dissed all the time, I love arts. You will not, you will not get your degree, you're automatically, you paid the money, you're part of the system, you're automatically failed. Unless you work towards good deeds unless you work towards getting that high mark. No one's just going to give you that mark. And so by default, just as a human being, just being here alive on earth, you're automatically going downhill unless you're working to grow. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifying. And there's only certain things that get you up there. 
that builds you as a human being إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except those who believe وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And do righteous works وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ And encourage one another with the truth وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ And encourage one another with patience and as I'm sure you've heard, Imam Shafi rahimahullah said that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only revealed this surah, just these few words, that it would have been enough, that on the day of resurrection, that it would have been enough as a proof against human beings. That this surah was revealed and you were warned. That this is what life is about. And what's interesting is you'll see repeated throughout the Qur'an again and again, even in the story of Qarun, the people who are given knowledge of the Qur'an, that there's actually just two things. That if you did it, you would have an amazing hereafter, an amazing life on earth. And that is Iman and Amal Salih. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except those who believed and do righteous deeds. And with those two things, if you carry that, Iman and righteous deeds, Iman and righteous deeds, your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then you live the life of righteous deeds, you would have success in this dunya and success in the hereafter. Now, on the opposite side, with all of this talk, what's actually interesting is that a lot of how we spend our lives is spent in things that aren't important, aren't urgent, right? It's not important that we're doing it, it's not urgent that we do it, but if you spend your time doing things like that, then your life, which is make, made up of these hours and minutes, becomes wasted. So you might come many years later and say, I haven't done anything. Why? Because you spent your time, or I spent my time, on things that weren't important to do, and they weren't urgent to do. <coughs> this doesn't mean that you have to basically do only serious things. It, that doesn't mean that. What's interesting in the story of Qarun, Qarun's story was actually similar to John Whittaker's story. That he was given this money and then destroyed because of the money. The people who had knowledge, they said to him, don't get all, like, don't do all this and all of this uh, corruption on the earth. But they said to him, they said, Don't forget your, your slice of life, basically, or your, your portion of the life. And so when you put your priority straight, first things first, you put your priority first, that it's to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your worship of Allah azza wa jalla. And when I say worship, what typically comes to people's mind is salah. And that's a key, but worship is everything that Allah loves. Whether it's a statement that you say on your tongue, or it's an action, whether you do it outwardly or inwardly, externally or internally, as long as it's something that Allah loves, it's considered ibadah. So when the brother up here said, you know, the collecting of the money for the tsunami victims, that was ibadah. That was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The distribution of food to the needy was ibadah, was the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even as he said it, I was saying to myself, not too many people realize that that really is the true message of Islam. It's to help the people. And that's in the core, that's the essence of what Islam is here for. It's just that not too many people know that. And not to, that, that message doesn't get around too far. It's usually, oh, it's nice to do a food bank, or it's nice to do, but they don't realize that that's why we're here, is to take care of the other uh, creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in conclusion, inshallah, I want to give you um, some tips. I want to give you some tips, ibnillah, for those of you who are graduating and for those of you who are, you know, still got some time in, this, uh, in the institute and, and moving forward, inshallah, ibnillah, that if you just apply some of these tips, and you don't necessarily have to apply all of them, but just apply some of them, inshallah ta'ala, you'll be driving in a whole new direction. So from the beginning, as you know, that if you ever get in your car and you don't know where you're going, what are the chances of you arriving there? What are the chances? Someone give me the chances, mathematician. If you don't know where you're going, what are the chances of you arriving? What are the chances? Two percent? You're obviously not in math. <laughs> yes? A hundred percent? Okay. It's actually, well, you can say 100% or you can say 0%. No, if you're going nowhere, so you're going right Okay, if you're going nowhere, then you're already there, right, basically. And subhanAllah, this is interesting, when I was in, um, in, in uh, grade school, whatever they call it, in, in Winnipeg, we had this little student planner, and there was a, a quote that I never forgot. It says, whoever aims for nothing hits it with remarkable success. <laughs> Whoever aims for nothing hits it with remarkable success. Meaning you're aiming for nothing, you're going to hit it 
which is nothing. And so, and, and it's actually not true because you are going to hit something. And what you're going to hit is what you saw in your unconscious. What you assume, this is what ibadah means at seven years old. Or this is what life is like. It's in your unconscious and you are driving towards it. It's just unconscious because you're a human being. You are going to drive towards something. And that's, you're just going to be pulled in a direction and you won't choose your direction. So what I'm telling you now is open up your brain math quest. Right, click it, and then it and it actually forwards to uh, a website called Surah Al-Baqarah, Breach of Covenant, <laughs> the Mother Institute class, the map. And the amazing thing that I saw in the Quran, right from Surah Al-Fatiha, right from the beginning of the Quran, that it tells the person where you are, where you stand in life. A lot of us think I'm a believer, right? I'm a believer. Say it. I'm a believer. But are we really believers? Are we really? And right from the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah divides the people into three categories. Believers, Mu'minun, disbelievers, Kuffar, and the third one is Munafiqun, is hypocrites. And what's interesting is when you go through the characteristic of the hypocrites, it's very scary. And we just assume that we're believers. But that might not be the case. And one way to measure that, just straight up, straight up, is how good our fajr is. And that will tell you right there, a little measure of whether we're believers or not. The Prophet ﷺ said that the hardest salah on the munafiqun are salat al-fajr and salat al-isha. And so if there's a problem with salat al-fajr, then you need to register for that class, inshallah ta'ala. <coughs> Anyhow, you have to know where you are if you go into a mall and you see, like it says, where all the stores are and you're looking for Laura Secord or you're looking for some other store, right? <coughs> and you find Laura Secord, you'll never make it there unless you actually look for one thing before that, which is that little red dot with a line that says, you are here. Because the map means nothing unless you know where you stand. You have to know where you are on the map first and then you have to know where you want to go. You want to go down here, and where you want to go is Jannah. Right? Take a right, and then take another right, and take another right, until you hit Jannah. Right? At full force. Not, stop, not slowing down, until you just keep going right, until you hit Jannah. And that's your destination. You know where you are. Where you are is taught by the Qur'an. If you've ever tried to find where you are somewhere else, you've gotten the wrong message. And what's scary is if you don't know the Qur'an, you haven't read the Qur'an, or you only know a couple of the small surahs, you might not know how to get there or where the destination is or where you stand. And then after that, the process. How do you get to Jannah? Because what's interesting is that a lot of the things we do in life will not get us to Jannah. And the Qur'an teaches us these steps on how to get there. You might just assume, and you will be correct that there's basics, but those are fundamentals of which there's details to it. And the Qur'an is full of those details, and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, showing a person where to go. So, when I ask a people, uh, people, usually someone picks me up from the airport or someone takes me, I'll ask them, where are you driving in life? And they're like, well, I'm trying to finish my degree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, after that, what are you planning to do? I don't know. You can get a job. Okay. <laughs> And then usually when, when someone says that, what's interesting is that, and I'm not talking about anybody specific by the way, um, usually when, when someone says that, what they might find is that when they actually go into the job market, they'll find that, um, they'll find that the degree that they were studying for isn't the one that they need for the job. Why? Because they didn't prepare for it. So for example, someone studies engineering, and then in the end they, be, they go into IT. I'm sure you know a lot of people like that. And they have to, after all those years of studying engineering, maybe master's, PhD, and then they have to take some um, Microsoft special certification course in one week, and then they become like, they get a job, and then after a few months they get fired. <laughs> you guys know the whole scenario, right? All these IT people. But if they had known from the beginning, this is what I want to do, then they could have studied the proper thing. They didn't have to waste six, eight, ten years of their life if they knew from the beginning. So similarly, in your life, not just your university time, but go beyond that. Where do you want to be at 40 years of age? Where do you want to be? What vision do you see when you close your eyes and say, I'm 40 years old, where are you? 
what are you doing at that time? And be careful when usually, um, even in class and even probably in the university here, maybe a teacher will do this with you. What do you want at age 40? The problem is human beings, when they decide for themselves what they want, they make the wrong choices. Why? Because they'll say that at age 40, I want a, a, a garage, two-door garage, I want to live by the beach, I want money, I want car. And I just told you what happens when you get that. They don't know what's best for them. And so what do you know? What do you want? You go back to the Qur'an and you actually see and take that guidance of where you should be at 40 years of age, where you should be at 60 years of age. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, mentions in the Qur'an that special moment. And I actually remember a brother that came to Medina and he said, today's my 40th birthday. And I'm like, I don't know about birthdays, brother, you know? And he says, no, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, there's something special about the 40th. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَبَلَغَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً Until he reaches his maturity and he reaches 40 years of age Then he makes a special prayer قَالَ رَبِّ أَوْزِعْنِي أَنْ أَشْكُرَ نِعْمَتَكَ الَّتِي أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيَّ وَعَلَى وَالِدَيْ وَأَنْ أَعْمَلَ صَالِحًا تَرْضَاهُ وَأَصْلِحْ لِي فِي ذُرِّيَّتِي إِنِّي تُبْتُ إِلَيْكَ وَإِنِّي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Do you, you want me to translate that or just let you go and read it up? Translate? No? <coughs> I'm running out of time. <laughs> Five more minutes? Inshallah. Uh, look it up, Inshallah. Go to one of the Qur'an indexes and you'll actually enjoy the process. Look up the number 40, and you'll find stories of Musa going to the mountain for 40 days, and then you'll find this, this dua. When the person reaches 40 age, what is he focused on in his prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And it's based on his family, it's based on his children, and it's based on thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the blessings that he's reached at 40. The next milestone is the age of 60. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the um, ages of my ummah are between 60 and 70. Meaning that it's most likely that if a person is going to live a whole life and they're not going to die before that, if they're Muslim, as the Prophet ﷺ said, it will be between the ages of 60 and 70. And so you're aiming at that age to die. The Prophet ﷺ died when he was 63 years, years old. And Abu Bakr who died two and a half years later basically at 63 years of age. And Umar, who was actually 13 years younger than the Prophet ﷺ, had his Khilafah for 11 years, 11 plus two and a half. Since the time of the Prophet he died at the age of 63. Three in a row, they all died at the age of 63. And so you're aiming at those two ages. The age 60, the Prophet said, Which basically means that if you reach 60 years of age and you haven't led a righteous life, there's no excuse after that. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you 60 years on this earth. You've seen all the reminders, you've been to all the halaqas. There's no excuse after that to not lead that righteous life. And if a person doesn't choose that path at age 60, they have no excuse in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, that a person needs to put first things first. And you might have heard this statement, but you might not know what is the first thing first. And the first thing first is putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Let's say you have an exam. And you know tomorrow you have an exam and it's super hard. And if you stay up to a certain point, you're going to miss Fajr. And now you have a conflict. You're going to miss Fajr or study for the exam. If your priorities are messed up, you're going to continue staying awake and you're going to miss Fajr. If the priorities are messed up. But I'll tell you this. If your priorities are set straight and you said, no, I'm going to sleep now. This may cause me to fail this exam, but who cares? <laughs> I'm going to put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Guess what will happen? You'll sleep properly like they say. And you may have forgotten these words of your teacher, but she said, get a good night's rest before the exam. You may have forgotten that. And so you forgot, you, everybody else told you cram, cram for the exam, cram for the exam, all of that stuff. But you said, no, I'm putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, I'm sleeping. And then you wake up at Fajr and then you're like, I'm not, I don't feel tired. Let me open up my notebook and start studying. And then you got like another three hours. Had you studied at night, you would have been drowsy on 
uh, cocaine, not cocaine, um, Coca-Cola, <laughs> and you would have been studying all night long with a half brain, and then you would have came to the exam, your brain would have been frazzled, you would have missed Fajr, you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you get a horrible mark on the exam, you fail, and boom, life is just, you know, it sucks after that. <laughs> but had you woken up for Fajr, not only did you correct your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you also made it, you got that mark on the exam, and you got your shadi. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what's interesting about, um, about this, I was once on the computer, and I was, I was holding my daughter, and she's the computer screen, you know how all the, all the distractions of the internet and the computer, and while I'm looking at the computer, She's looking at me like, you know, with her eyes, and she's winking her eyes like that. And then, and then I'm like, computer screen or her? And then I'm like, you know, how can I waste my time with the computer? Like, this comes first. Right? So when you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, and then your family. Put Allah first, and then your family, and then everything falls into place after that. Everything becomes good. But switch it around and try to put your pursuit of money above Allah and above your family and you're just you're on that path to hellfire if it comes before because everything's going to mess up and it just builds from there um, thirdly if you've ever um, tried to start a diet or something I know you guys are in university you've tried lots of diets how many people have read about a diet? read about diets Atkins and all of that stuff as soon as you read the diet what it tells you is that your whole life up until now you need to trash you need to throw it all in the garbage everything you used to love as a child is junk and your life has to change from now on right in general and the diets that don't work tell you you can eat what you want kind of thing <laughs> what I'm telling you that's with regards to your physical health with regards to your spiritual help with regards to your time everything that you might be doing up till now needs to be trashed if you're not living the life if you feel unfulfilled uh, and satisfied with your life it might be all the internet time wasting it might be all the TV it might be all the driving around it might be all the restaurants that you spend a little too long talking to brothers or sisters talking to sisters about how they need to get married and stuff like that <laughs> number four is um, delegating, which basically means in the word of uh, Islam, it means working in jama'ah. And that means not trying to be a one-man show, but uh, working with other people. And the last thing is that have a higher purpose in life. A higher purpose than your basic, you know, I need to make money so I get a house, so I can, you know, do this and that. Have a higher purpose of serving humanity. And if you get that from now, and you have that higher purpose from now, inshallah ta'ala, you'll get that fulfillment that puts everything into order. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah ta'ala, um, I'm going to be here in Toronto. At the, is it the end of this month? The class? Inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to be teaching Tafsir Surah Al-Baqarah. And amazingly, a lot of MSAs, when they do events, they have kind of like these lectures on how to... Um, purify our intentions and how to, you know, purify our souls, those kind of lectures. And what's interesting is that Surah Al-Baqarah is exactly that. It's a purify your soul, it's a, it's a detox of your body, a detox of your mind, detox of your whole system before you prepare. And the reason I actually, this is the poster for the class, you might see it around campus and so on and so forth. Um, the reason I chose to teach this tafsir is because when the Muslim conquered different lands, and I, and I taught that class, what I realized is that everywhere they went, everywhere they went, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, everywhere they went, when they went into countries, they went into cities, they went into townships, they taught the Qur'an. And so, if you're from Damascus, you're from North Africa, your ancestors grew up in Qur'an halakas with the companions of the Prophet And that gave them the power to move forward. And unfortunately, we, we haven't taught the Qur'an the way it needs to be taught. And that's why right after I finished that class, I said, that's it, the next class, to see Surah Al-Baqarah. Starting in the Qur'an and teaching Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala's message. And when you teach Qur'an, you can't go wrong, except to hear that message of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala and keep going right, finding out where you are, where you need to go, and how to get there. Jazakumullah khairan. I hope, even that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala gives myself, gives you, tawfiq to reach those higher goals, so that when we die, there's no regrets. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu wa la ilaha anta astaghfiruka wa tubu alaykum assalamu alaykum